Good evening. How's everyone doing? I want to welcome you all to this next installment of the Time Warp Wife uh, with their Bible study devotional. It's on the Book of Romans. If anybody's interested, you can go on Amazon and here's the book. It's really awesome. I've, I've just started myself and I'm right now in the middle of chapter two. I want to share chapter one and, and, and as much as I can of chapter two with all of you, but I want to most of all share what God's shown me in it, and I want to hopefully make things as clear for you as possible. There's so much in these chapters that really is, especially when you start off with this, and that's what we're going to do. Now, I have links here to the Facebook page for the Time Warp Wife. And also, the introduction to the Bible study. The whole free Bible study God and everything. I have this posted here. So you've got to check it out. This is really awesome. You know, when I first learned of Romans, I learned bits and pieces of it, like the Romans Road to Salvation. But really studying it, I didn't really get to do it until I got to college. And, and man, I, I learned so much. And there were things that I unlearned. You know, things that, that I had to rewire my spiritual hard drive over and I'm going to get into that a teeny bit today uh, I don't intend to go down any quote-unquote rabbit holes but there are things about this that need to be said so I hope you don't mind so come along and join me with this I'm also going to post this on Darlene's page and the Time Warp Wife in Facebook I hope she doesn't mind but I want to invite you all to join me in this Bible study and this first blog entry. Let's get started. Well, first off, I, I have the questions here. You can click on this link for, for the, the Bible study guide and you'll find the questions in there. And I also have links, specifically postings for chapter one and chapter two from uh, the Time Warp Wife Facebook page. But first off, when you read when you read chapter one, and I encourage you to do so, you see so much in this. You see that Paul is explaining so profoundly what it what what saves, who saves. I love that in particular in verse five, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of in Jesus Christ. And he goes on in this, he says in particular how he's really dying to meet the church. He hasn't met them yet. When he wrote this, I believe he wrote this during his first missionary journey. From what I'm, I'm gathering, uh, according to my, my, my notes, I believe he wrote this during his three month stay in Greece, early 57 AD on his third missionary journey. So I'm cor correct myself there. Sorry about that. But from where I stand here, Romans is about three things. Salvation, that's the main thing. The righteousness of God, justification, sin, and God's sovereignty. That, that's basically the, 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 the five important things out of this. But here, one of the key things that I have here in this verse, where he says, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. And to unwise. So as much as in as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. And he goes on to say, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And it says here, this is the key thing, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And he goes on from 16 to 32 about how God's wrath is revealed on all in all unrighteousness but I want to go back a little bit uh, question the first question and I love how with Darlene doing this because she, she kind of gets the basics here and I want to uh, first Paul was called to be an apostle what is an apostle and how is it different from a disciple well this is my my perspective on it an apostle according to definition I found is one who is either an ambassador or messenger commissioned to carry out 
the instructions of the commissioning agent. Another definition is one who is sent. This is different because a disciple is someone who follows. And that's what the disciples of Jesus were. They were followers of Christ. I mean, we are, yes. Apostles were one who were sent to preach the gospel. You see what I'm saying? And in a sense, the disciples went from disciples to apostles. They went from followers to being one who was sent. So that's such a powerful thing. And if you read here, I encourage you to read the, the postings I have for chapter one and chapter two that Darlene offers in this area. And she also asks for the definition, the Greek word for servant here is dualos. And the meaning of that word is slave. It's, it's a Greek word, just in case anybody's wondering. But also, as I was saying before, Paul is writing to the Romans because he wants to visit them soon. And ultimately, he, he does get to. He gets to when he has his first imprisonment in Rome, I believe. And he says here he wants to visit these new believers because he wants to be an encouragement to them and help them grow in their faith. He's really concerned for them, and, and who'd blame him? They're, they're dealing with a lot of things. He's having a lot of his epistles are, are dealing with the fact that Christ is the only way to salvation. And you'll see that. You'll see that in a lot of the books in, in Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians. I mean, even in Philippians, Philippians is, is, is a bit unique. And in, in he, he talks about joy in, in your situation. But here in, in these epistles, especially in this in this epistle of Romans, he is pointing out that Jesus is the only one that saves. The gospel of Christ, which is the next question about how Paul describes that, that it is the power of God unto salvation. It's for everyone. And most of all, Paul refuses to be ashamed of it. That's my question for you. Are you willing to stand up for the gospel of Christ? I've been reading so many interesting Seeing, hearing is stories, uh, news reports, uh, instances of Christians who were willing to be openly condemned for their faith. I just read this morning of a man, uh, last name of Lively, uh, Pastor Lively. I'm hoping I'm, I'm using that uh, through who was being defended through Liberty Council. He was falsely accused of crimes against humanity by a group that calls itself Smug, which is something out of, because he went to Uganda and in love offered deliverance from homosexuality. He taught against homosexuality and he did it in a loving manner. Well, he was accused of crimes of, against humanity. Like, like genocide and things of that nature. He was being equated with somebody like Nikolai Koshescu or Adolf Hitler. And he, all he was doing was preaching and speaking the truth. Well, the, the judge that was on it took his time for five years, but had to dismiss the case, but not before he just said some really nasty, untrue and defamatory things against Lively. But there are other instances. We have Sweet Cakes Bakery, the owners, and you look that up. But there's a situation there, and that's where it leads to something else that, that, uh, and with, with the next few questions here. Number one, of course, we're dealing with righteousness. God's righteousness, it's something that you can't mess with. The Greek word for it is diakosinine. And basically that means it's the state or quality of being righteous. It's pure, it's, it's, it's what God is. Here, it's, according to my notes, righteousness is a legal term equal to acquittal. The word is used when the accused is declared, when the accused is declared not guilty. Theologically, it means the state of being right with God, being acquitted when tried by him. And the only way to attain it is through placing one's faith and trust in Jesus Christ, which is in the next question. And then the next question is something very important. How does God reveal his invisible nature to man? Well, simply put, he does it through his creation. See, everything you see out there, you know, the beauty, it, 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 there's a designer and it's God himself. And it's interesting because if you go on here, 
where he says about the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. What a statement, very powerful statement. And it goes on. Here's the next question. It says here, what are some of the ways that man has turned against God? Well, if you read here from verses 21 through 23, you see how they're doing that. It says he, and, and what I have here is they, they do, do it through pride, idolatry, deceit, lying, murder, denying God's very existence. And then they instill this, they're trying to instill it in our children. Now, if I'm going down rabbit holes, pardon me, but this is the truth. They've also turned against God by placing creation above him. If you read here, it says here, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. There's another part that's, if you go down here, in 25, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. That's what's going on right now, people. I'm not joking. That's going on right now. We're, we're seeing things like that, where they're placing creation and things and man above God. We're defiling God's natural laws through adultery, premarital, extramarital. <laughs> adultery and extramarital sex are the same thing. Don't mind me. But we're defiling God's natural design for sex through premarital, extramarital, and yes, homosexual sex sin. If you go further, here, verses 26 on, 26 and 27, they speak about that. It says here, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing that which is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. So here what's happening is we have all these different ways, if you read in here, that, that people are rebelling and going against God, that they have turned against God. And the end result, well, here's the next question. What has God done as a result of their wickedness? Well, he said, okay, you want to live like this? Go right on ahead, but you're not going to like the consequences. You're not going to like the results. He not only gave man over to his desires, but also to reap the consequences of it. And what consequences do we have of it? Look at everything that's going on around here. A divorce rate going way through the roof. Uh, last I heard, it's at 50%, probably even more. We have unwed mothers, and I'm, and I'm not knocking them. There's no way I'm knocking a single mom who's had a child and they're not married. I applaud them. But we also have instances where people are having sex in any way, shape, or form, whether it's premarital, extramarital, or homosexual sex sin. And that's something I want to get into in, in a few moments. But bottom line here, God is basically saying, okay, you want this? Go ahead and have it, but you're not going to like the results. That's what's going on. We have STDs going on right now. We have, look at all the stuff that's going on, that's been going on the last couple of weeks. You know, what took place in, in England in particular. That's really sad, don't you think? And it's because of, of the evil that's risen up. And people want to say, they can say if they want, you know, oh, that's really not Islam. But it is. But also, it's bottom line because man has chosen to rebel against God. And God said, okay, go for it, but you're not going to like the results. And it says here, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. But being, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, malice, ma maliciousness, excuse me, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, 
They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. That's what we've got going on right now, people. We are living in a moment where we are, where basically we are living in a time where we're doing whatever we want, whenever we want, without thought for any of the consequences. And this started, I firmly believe, this started in a few major areas. I think first it started when Madeline Murray O'Hare successfully got the Supreme Court to remove prayer and Bible reading from public schools. You know, my husband, who is going to be 62 this December, remembers that day as a child. All of a sudden that stopped and he couldn't figure out why it made no sense to him. Then in 1973, that was when they legalized murdering unborn innocent lives. And that gets me even more so. And the worst of it is, we as Christians, we're guilty of so many things. We're guilty of either not doing enough, or we're guilty of doing, I don't want to say too much, we're guilty of going overboard. We're guilty in particular when it comes to the issue of homosexuality. We're either going along to get along, or... We're going overboard and where we're being overly critical, we're being obnoxious. You know, something that I, I was reading in my notes that I, I wanted to share with all of you. I have this here and this is something that, that God really got me. Uh, something I, I learned when it comes to that. God showed me something very important uh, when, it, when it came to that. And I wanted to share that with you guys. Uh, when I was in college, I had the awesome privilege of sitting in a class called Human and Cultural Diversity. And this class was a very powerful class to me because there was something that I learned out of this that really, really convicted me and got me. We got on the issue of homosexuality, of all things. And one of the first things out of my professor's mouth that I was absolutely shocked over was God loves gays and lesbians and so do I. And I will tell you right now that floored me is the only way to describe it. It floored me. I couldn't believe he was saying this because I thought there's no way that they're deserving of love. There's no way that God loves them. They're evil. They're disgusting. You know, I, I was thinking the worst of them. And he started going on and he says, how many of you, I want to make sure I'm wording this right. He says, how many of you have called someone who was gay a, a foul name? And I'm not going to use the words here. That's not, that's not what I'm about here. But he started going on about it. And he says, if you've done that, you're committing, you're, you're, you're sinning. You're sinning against God. Because in God's eyes, he, say, he doesn't show any partiality. If you read, especially in chapter 2, he says, God's not partial to anybody. And that really got me. It, it convicted me so badly. It really did. I don't know how else to describe it. And I had to ask the Lord to forgive me of my attitude. I had to, I had to repent of my attitude. And I had to learn how to love the sinner. While still standing against the sin. But also, God showed me that that doesn't mean that he values this, that he devalues any sin. Because one of the things also that this professor said is that homosexual sex sin is no greater or lesser than premarital or extramarital sex sin. That got me. In other words, sin is sin in God's eyes. And I want to read something out of my notes. It says here, the Bible says that homosexuality is a sin. Read Genesis 18 verses 20 and 21 and chapter 19 verses 3 through 7. That's about Sodom and Gomorrah. In God's holiness, it's, it, it refers to this as one of the very grave sins of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Leviticus 18 and 20 also list many unlawful sexual relations, including homosexuality, which is Leviticus 18, 22 and 20 verse 13. And the New Testament also addresses passages on this. Romans 1 verses 18 to 32, especially 26 and 27 and 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9. So you want to make sure you realize that. But it says basically here, the church has been guilty at times in the way they've reacted to this sin, demonizing it as an unforgivable sin when God can forgive any sin. And it states here how we should respond. First, for the person that's struggling with it, just as with any sexual temptation, you need to run from it and seek godly counsel. James 4 verse 7 states, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And also, love people and share the truth. You must love the sinner, since all are sinners. But you should view sin as God views it, detestable, requiring the death of his son. If the church would truly learn to love people, more people would be open to hearing the truth of the gospel. And I think that's very true. As a result of, of the wickedness, man is reaping the end result. We're reaping it, but God in his infinite love and mercy, God in his infinite love and mercy is still standing at the door of every heart, no matter who you are, no matter what lifestyle you're leading. And he wants to save you. And in chapter two, which I am going to, I am giving you notes for, uh, you know, and you can find the questions for as well. Uh, we'll try to go over that on Friday. Maybe I'll even try to, to do something tomorrow. I don't know yet, but I want to close with this. The point Paul is trying to make here is that Christ is the only way to salvation, that it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what you've done, that Christ can and will save you if you will let him. He says here that he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God to salvation to anyone, everyone who is willing to believe, who is willing to receive Christ in their life. And I hope and pray that if you're out there, if you were watching this and you don't know Christ, that you'll make that decision to come to know him today, to know that nothing you say or do, absolutely nothing you say or do can save you. I mean, if you read in chapter two, you see that God does not play favorites. You see, he, he says here, for there is no partiality with God. For as many as have sinned without the law will also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. In other words, in God's eyes, everybody's the same. Nobody's better than the other, which is why we have Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. And I'm urging all of you out there. I'm urging all of you today to choose today to place your faith and trust in Christ Jesus. Don't let the lies you've been told that there are other paths, other ways to heaven. Or the de deceitful belief that there is no God fool you there is only one way to heaven and that is through the blood bought son through jesus christ he says i am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the father but by me god very much does exist he's just holy and righteous he hates sin but the cool thing is he loves you if you look back at this morning's devotions that moment when Sin entered into the world through Adam and Eve, into humanity through Adam and Eve. God provided at that moment a way of salvation. He said he was going to put enmity between the woman and the serpent, between her seed and him. And that the offspring 
the, the promise of salvation would bruise his, would, would, would crush his head. He would bruise his heel. That was a promise of salvation. And that was Christ Jesus. <coughs> I am inviting you right now to call on his name today. To, to receive him as your savior today. Let him come into your heart. Ask him to forgive you of whatever sins you may have committed what you, or you've committed. Trust me, he'll forgive it. He doesn't care about your lifestyle. He doesn't care if you're a drug addict, sex addict, alcohol addict. If you're sex, uh, you know, as I said, sex addict, whatever you've done, he does not care. Just confess it and forsake it. He will forgive it. He doesn't care if you're Jewish, Buddha, Buddhist, Muslim, anything. Just let him in your heart. Don't let your pride keep you from the Savior, but choose to accept him today. I have a link here. Please don't mind me. I have a link here. Pause this and click it. Read it and make that decision to come to know Christ today. Don't miss out. Seriously. I've got to get going. I've got a whole bunch to take care of today. But I encourage you guys to read chapter 2. And to those who have accepted Christ, I'd love to hear from you. I want to help point you in the right direction, help you maybe find a good local church. But most of all, I want to reach out to, to, to those who are studying this to know that you are loved by an almighty God and that even though you, you know that you have that eternal life if you've accepted him. And I encourage you to continue reading this, to continue reading chapter two, to look up, you know, click on these links, to check out what Darlene is saying. I, I love what she says in it. And I hope it really blesses you guys. So until tomorrow, or until at least Friday, you guys have a wonderful evening. Bye for now.